talk is about attestation. Do you already know what is attestation? Have you have ever heard of attestation as a term? I hope this talk is the right one for you because I'll just give a very high level introduction to this topic so you get an idea what it is. It is not so technical. What I'm presenting is a, a research presentation. So I'll tell you what's going on in this area. So in case you are interested on this, you can dig into the details by yourself or you are welcome to contact me and I'm very uh, happy to uh, to talk about this. Actually, attestation was a very weird term for me and exactly because it looks so weird, I look into that and then I did my PhD on this. So you never know. A little bit about me. I finished my PhD in 2020 at Sapienza University in Rome. And actually I don't say it, but in communities like this, I'm very happy for the first time to say that publicly that uh, I've been working as software developer for six years and I thought I was born to be a developer. But then I did my PhD and then I came to DDU as a postdoc and recently I am an assistant professor at Alborg University. So I shifted my focus. Today I'll give a brief introduction to this topic and overall this talk is organized in two, three main parts. First, I'll tell about IoT security and why attestation is a relevant topic and how it fits in the IoT security context. Then I will uh, present three main approaches of uh, attestation protocols that have been proposed in the literature. I have selected those protocols that I think that have significantly contributed to this field, not necessarily my work, so I'm a I try to be a bit fair on this. And then I will conclude with some uh, open challenges on uh, uh, this topic so you can uh, have an idea about the future works. As you already know, IoT devices are everywhere now. We have smart cities. IoT devices are transforming the traditional systems into smart systems. So now we are talking about smart buildings, smart transportation, smart manufacturers, and so on. Overall, IoT devices fall into three main categories. IoT devices that are deployed in industrial setting, for example, smart manufacturers. IoT devices for infrastructure, for example, the smart cities. And then uh, IoT devices that are closer to us, consumer IoT devices, for example, those in the smart homes. A part of this important uh, roles of IoT devices. There are also many IoT devices around us, which I don't have any specific term, but I call them nonsense IoT devices because I don't understand why we should connect an iron to a mobile phone. But if you know it, I'll just remove that picture. And as a result, we see that IoT devices are exposed to many cyber attacks. In Pacemaker some years ago, uh, thousands of uh, vulnerabilities were found. And uh, some years ago was also this famous case of uh, uh, attack in the casino, that, which you may ha already have heard, that uh, the attackers managed to compromise the database of a casino because of vulnerability in a thermostat that was in a fish tank in the casino. So now the, it's not only the point of attacking the IoT itself, but is the impact that this device is bringing to the entire uh, infrastructure because IoT devices are not isolated devices, they are interconnected. There are many reasons why IoT devices are prone to cyber attacks, but here I list three of them, which I think that are the main reasons. And the first reason is that IoT devices are very easy to get exploited by attackers because they have limited resources, they have limited storage, limited computation power. So basically, it's very easy for an attack to, to, to attack them and to succeed. Second, IoT devices are increasingly getting deployed in safety critical domains. They, have, they contain private and sensitive information. They are able to control the environment. So the attackers are actually very interested in targeting these devices. And third, IoT devices are interconnected. So once the attacker manages to compromise one device, that the malware can easily get spread across the network. So uh, the 
IoT systems amplify the impact of an attack. What can we do? Of course, you may think security by design. This is the best choice, of course. It's very important that when we design an IoT device, the security is considered from the very early stage of the device, from the beginning. We design everything with security in mind. So when we talk to companies and we tell them that it's important to consider security, especially for IoT devices, they want security, but they don't uh, have security, cybersecurity experts. Sometimes it's very understandable because they are startups, they do not have resources. Sometimes companies are not interested, even those that uh, are medium sized or so. They do not have uh, resources to invest additional money and time to provide security from the beginning. And then there is also this tendency that IoT devices are cool, we are competitors, we have to launch these devices as soon as possible. So there is this strategy, rush to market. So when we talk to companies about security by design, what they actually understand is security by magic. They want security without doing anything. As a result, we can say security by design, yes, is the best way how we can prevent a device to get compromised but actually, it is difficult to be achieved for these reasons that I mentioned. And even if we design a secure IoT device, actually, we never can guarantee that 100% this device is secure. But at some point, we assume the malware will get there. Maybe a bit difficult to get if we consider security, but because of this limited resources of IoT devices, device can eventually get compromised. So it's a reasonable assumption, I think. So if the device is gonna get compromised sooner or later, what is the, be the second best option we can do is to detect at least. So if, the, if a device gets compromised, at least we should have some malware detection techniques on place that we understand this as soon as possible. Then we isolate the device. We maybe update the device or uh, or we uh, disconnect it from the rest of the network uh, until it is restored and so on. And this malware detection is also a bit easier to, to achieve, but it's not so trivial. Why? Because if we want to detect the malware on the device and we're asking, asking the device, are you compromised? If the malware is there, it's not gonna tell you, yes, I'm compromised. Are you fine? Yes, I'm fine. And it's not the device that is answering, but is the malware inside the device that is answering. So the goal is how can we detect malware on a compromised device and trust the answer? So in this context, remote attestation has been proposed as a, as a promising approach. It's a security protocol that you can install inside the device and then you trust this protocol and then you ask this protocol, is my device trusted or not. So basically we have two parties, one verifier, which is the trusted party, and an untrusted party, which is the prover. And the goal is to allow this verifier to, to check if this prover, the device is trusted or not. For example, you have all these IoT devices now that are deployed in remote environments. We have uh, in the roof of the building, we have security cameras and so on. We have uh, in the uh, forest, underwater, and so on. So it's very reasonable to assume that we are not physically close to the device. But even if we are physically close to the device, we have so many IoT devices, even at home, that it's not practical that you physically open the device and check is this trusted or not. So you need some techniques to, to communicate with this device remotely and then to trust this answer. So, Remote attestation, actually, is not a new thing. Perhaps you have heard it from TPM. We have in our laptops now, there is a TPM, which is a chip that provides exactly this, the, the attestation of, uh, of the laptop, for example. But the setting is different. In the, in the computer, we have the manufacturer, which produces the TPM, 
and it certifies the TPM that is uh, inside the computer. And the goal of attestation in this case is that when you get the answer from the TPM, the verifier can check, is this answer coming from a certified TPM? And if the answer is coming from a certified TPM, you trust that this device uh, is fine, otherwise the TPM wouldn't have signed it. TPM is standardized by uh, trusted computing groups, so the standardized body, but the, there is no standardization for IoT. Another uh, example of attestation in traditional systems is SGX. In the cloud, when you have some enclaves where critical parts of the software are running inside the, uh, these enclaves. Another interesting uh, development is confidential computing, uh, which is uh, now uh, in the beginning, I think, of this initiative. There are many important parties that have been involved into that. Until now, we have been talking about uh, uh, securing data in transit and uh, data at rest, but it's also important to secure data uh, in use. So if uh, there is this uh, initiative, Confidential Computing, that tries to develop a way how can we uh, secure data in use. And one key aspect of that is attestation. So eventually attestation uh, in the next 10 years or so is expected to be a standard uh, secure for securing end-to-end, -to, -end, uh, to guarantee end-to-end -end security. But this is for traditional systems. In IoT, we have even basic uh, problems because of uh, the challenges of designing uh, secure uh, algorithms in, uh, or secure protocols in IoT. So, in this second part, I'll present three different approaches uh, what has been in the literature about designing uh, attestation protocols for IoT devices. In IoT devices, we have two parties, the verifier and the prover. The verifier generates the nonce. The verifier can be, uh, for example, the laptop that you have, you trust your laptop, or you are the owner and you are checking the device, or the network operator or security administrator and so on. Can be, uh, you can assume it as a device or as a person. Then generate a nonce, so it's a unique value, can be a timestamp, and sends this challenge to the prover, to the device. The device performs attestation, which is the simplest case that you can imagine. Compute the hash of the software that is running. You know what is the latest version. I'm sticking with the camera example. You know what is the latest uh, version of the software that you have installed in your camera, and if the device is performing the hash, you should know what is the hash of that software that you installed. The simplest uh, example. So the device performs the hash, signs this hash and sends you the value. Then the verifier checks this value. Now the verifier knows what should be the hash uh, in the device, knows what is the challenge that's sent to the device, can compute by itself the expected answer. If they match, the verifier says, yes, this device is trusted now. It's very important to consider that, to, to remember that Attestation does not say anything what happened to the device one second before attestation or one second after in itself, in the typical scenario. Attestation is a way to, to establish trust in this moment. So I can say that at this moment the device is trusted, but I don't know, maybe after I do the attestation it will be compromised, or maybe it was compromised, the malware just removed itself, and when I came to attest it was fine. So it is establishing trust only at that moment. Of course, there are some approaches to extend this, but in the typical scenario. Then we have adversaries. There are many adversaries, so we have this attestation, but then we have different adversaries that we have to consider. We have an attacker that is a software attacker. It is remotely, it is knows that that uh, version of the software that you have installed, it is vulnerable, so it's trying to exploit it, or it can be locally or can be an adversary that is moving uh, in different regions of the memory and so on. There is also hardware adversary when the attacker is physically there. And in that case, it's not much that you can do actually. But the basic assumption of a remote attestation protocol, the minimal, hard, uh, the minimal adversary that a remote attestation protocol has to detect is remote adversary. The others are good 
to a test, but you cannot design a remote attestation protocol if it does not detect a remote software adversary. So if you are at home and you are checking your device and the adversary is also at home and is attacking your device, at least you should detect this kind of adversary with the same weapons, let's say. Then if the adversary is there physically at your device and you are checking remotely, of course, there are some uh, ways of trying to detect that, but it's not much you can do. You can uh, try to, to extract the device and so on. Of course, you can uh, rely also on temp temper evident parts, but uh, if the attacker is managing to, to extract, there's not much you can do. So considering this remote, attesta remote uh, software adversary and considering the steps of attestation, what are the some requirements that an attestation protocol should have? So the first thing is that the challenge sent by the verifier to the prover should be unique. If the adversary can predict the, your challenge, then adversary can compute the correct answer in advance, goes to the device, compromises the device. Whenever you ask for attestation, just sends always the, the correct answer. So this challenge should be unique, so the adversary does not compute in advance the correct answer. So the device should perform attestation in that moment. Then attestation itself should be authentic, should be signed, and should be, should be unforgeable. Then the verification also should be deterministic. So the verifier should know if this is trusted or not. There are many attestation protocols that have been proposed in the literature. They change by themselves from different aspects. First is what assumption they are considering on the device, what are the memory regions of the device they are attesting, how many devices, one device or many devices, if we are considering many devices, are these devices mobile or they are static, and so on. So remote attestation is not a new topic. It has been there for 20 years. Actually, I think it was uh, in 2000s, the first papers on that, and I think it was tightly connected to the first release of the TPM. So when there was the first release of the TPM for uh, traditional computers um, in 2001, by that time was the answer, or it was the question, how can we design attestation for wireless sensor networks? In that time, we didn't have the term IoT, but we had wireless sensor networks. And wireless sensor networks were so small uh, devices, like smoke detectors and so on, that it was uh, and completely impractical to consider hardware assumptions. So the first, uh, the first uh, solutions were just software-based. We install the software there, and then we, uh, we get the, the answer. But the software-based attestation are insecure, are very good, actually, because you don't rely on any hardware assumptions. But uh, they are insecure, and they come with some strong uh, requirements on the uh, Verifier should know exactly what hardware is there, how much time it takes, and so on, to rely on this. Then, uh, to, to, to tackle these problems of, of software-based attestation, there is hi hybrid-based attestation. From the term, it is like software, but it comes with some lightweight hardware um, uh, requirements in order to make it suitable for IoT devices. And this is the state of the art even nowadays. All the new remote attestation protocols rely on hybrid-based attestation. You have the software part of the protocol that you install, but you have some minimal requirements for hardware to guarantee that at least your protocol itself is not compromised. If the attacker is changing your protocol, you cannot trust the answer of that protocol. Then in 2015 uh, in, uh, and 2016, there were the first papers that um, attested a large group of IoT devices. And these papers were published in the top security conferences. And uh, from them, from, uh, from 2015, there have been many papers, when I say many, 20, 30 uh, swarm attestation papers that rely on different assumptions. We have mobile devices, no, but we don't have only IoT devices. We have also age devices. What if the age device is the verifier and all these different scenarios? So we have swarm attestation. So it was, how can we attest a large group of IoT devices efficiently? Then 
until until 2016, all that station relied on that hash that I said. So if the uh, rely on the assumption that if the if the software on the device has changed, the hash will be different. However, this does not detect runtime attacks, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, where the attacker is not changing the software, but is uh, changing the RAM. So it's compromising the device by only by modi uh, modifying the order of the execution in the RAM. And in 2016 was the first paper that proposed contraflow attestation to detect this kind of attacks. And from, them, from there, there have been many other papers that rely exactly on the same solution, but try to extend it on different ways. In 2019, there were the first protocols that introduced the term distributed. So we have uh, here swarms, but we have one verifier, then distributed came for two in two different contexts. One was having many verifiers that attest many devices. And then there is this uh, work here that I did during my PhD, uh, which was, it's not enough to just aggregate these results of, of large networks, but we need also to consider that IoT devices are exchanging information. If one IoT device is compromised, it may affect all the network. So it was in this uh, distributed services. And from, 2000, uh, 20, uh, from this year, there is a, I think the first paper on the privacy of uh, IoT devices, and this is a paper that I uh, co-authored with a PhD student at DTU, and it was, pub it was published also in a very good uh, security uh, conference. So this is a high level. Now we'll see the, so I, uh, we'll see three, three main protocols, hybrid, swarm, and control flow. So in the hybrid attestation, we have the verifier uh, and the verifier and the prover. And the verifier knows in advance what is the expected uh, state of the prover. The prover, as I said, is untrusted, but it is assumed to have an, a trusted component inside, which is a minimal hardware assumption. It can be just uh, a memory part that from, uh, for example, a ROM that the adversary cannot write into that. And then he, there you, write, you store your protocol. But it can be also um, uh, architecture of the device, which uh, we'll see in the next slide. So the verifier sends a challenge. Then the trusted component, so the protocol that is inside, uh, measures the so the the state of the untrusted software, so basically computes a hash, signs this hash, and then sends it to the verifier. Then the verifier can uh, compute, can get this answer, compute the expected answer, and then see if this match or not, and then says if the device is trusted or not. In this uh, uh, IoT devices now that are in ARM architecture, actually this trusted component comes as a built-in security. So you have this uh, part here, which uh, runs a different operating system, and that uh, guarantees the secure isolation of two worlds. It's called their normal world and secure world. I think this is important to know, uh, even outside of attestation, because this part here, uh, in this case, is used to run attestation because it's a security critical uh, operation, but it can run even um, uh, you can consider it to run an operation that is very important for the device, which is highly, uh, should be highly secure and so on. And then you have uh, this uh, secure isolation of the device itself. You can run your protocol here or the function here. And there is an interface, how you can communicate between the normal world and the secure world. Then was the second approach, swarm attestation. And when we talk about swarm attestation, the goal is how can we attest a large group of IoT devices in more efficiently, more efficient way than attesting each of the devices one by one. And there was this paper called uh, SEDA that proposed this um, approach. And the idea overall was like this. You have the verifier, you have a network. The verifier just picks up a random device in the network and uh, that that device, a random device, will serve as a root of this network. So it will be a spanning tree distributed on that uh, 
root. So all the network will be uh, uh, reconstructed as a spanning tree in order to have an efficient way of communicating in this network. So that the station request will be distributed through this spanning tree, through all the networks. Then that the station will be also aggregated through this um, through this uh, spanning tree. That the station will start from the leaps first. Then you that will send that the station answer to the uh, parents, then this attestation will be aggregated and then finally it will be sent to the verifier. So we have some aggregators and then some provers in this uh, case. This was a very nice uh, work that influenced a lot the field of remote attestation for swarms. Um, it has um, a single point of failure because in this uh, in this case, but then it has been extended in the literature in other cases. So if the uh, first device here is compromised by itself, then it will compromise all the answers of the network in this uh, situation. Then uh, another uh, drawback of this work is that the network topology is static. So because we have this uh, construction of spanning tree, we cannot have a spanning, we, I mean, it's, it's not practical to assume the construction of spanning tree when the devices are mobile. So spanning tree requires the devices are static, for example, in a uh, manufacturer, uh, in the floor of manufacture and so on. Also that the station is static. So it considers only when the uh, code has been injected on the device. So the binaries have been changed in the device. Then was dynamic attestation, which is control flow attestation, exactly to, uh, to extend the static attestation for not, uh, for not uh, detecting only attacks that inject a code, but those that change also the RAM. So the goal is, not, is to detect runtime attacks. So here is a very high level visualization of code injection attacks. So if we have this very simple code, if the user is authenticated, then do this in uh, node B. Otherwise, do this in node C, and this is represented as a control flow graph. So the control flow graph shows the flow of this small uh, toy uh, program here. So if we have this instruction in node A executed, then we have this instruction in node B, uh, which will go to E and then go to D, uh, and then in this other way. So we, when we have a code injection attack, there will be a vulnerability exploited somewhere, and then the attacker will inject a new code in this software. So if there is a presentation like this as a graph, then we'll have a new node here, so the graph will look something like this. And this is what usually, what the typical attestation could detect, because there is a new code that is injected, so the hash should be different. But when we talk about runtime attacks, then there we have something like this. We don't have a new code added in the, in the device, but the attacker is manipulating something in the, uh, in the code and is just changing the order of the execution. And this is called code reuse attack. There are uh, code that have been loaded in the RAM. The attacker just changing the stack pointers is able to execute the codes in different order. The code is legitimate, is the one that should be there, but by changing the order of execution, the device is doing something that it is not intended to do. In this case, even if the user is not logged in, can still uh, execute that part of function that is dedicated only for authorized, uh, authenticated users. So how to detect this uh, kind of attack? There was this paper called CIFLAT, published in CCS 2016. And uh, they had this idea that if we trace the execution of the software, then we can generate one single hash value that shows, okay, this was the execution flow. How they do it? Consider that we had the same graph. So you have a software in, in the device, you can construct offline your, the control flow graph of that, and then the verifier can also generate a hash. How the verifier generates the hash, and I think this was the key uh, contribution of this work that was then followed by many other approaches, was that you have a hash in the beginning, which is uh, created some hash of zero because we don't have any previous node. And then you have some, as I told, we can have this path here or this path here, and both paths are legitimate. So if the user is authenticated, it can go in this way, or if the user is not authenticated, the software will follow this path. 
So there are two legitimate paths. The first one is the, the, the hash in node A is, starts from zero because we don't have any previous node. Then the hash in node B is the hash of the previous hash and the node B. So hash two here will be hash of the hash one and node B. And so it goes on and in node D, the hash can be hash of hash five uh, of node D. So we have a hash that is uh, created from the previous hash. So here will be one, one hash that is a valid one if the software followed this path. Then we'll have another hash that is created in this way. So node D can have two hashes as valid points. One is if the, if the software followed this, this path and the other is if the software followed this path. So if the so if the software follow, follow this path like this, then it will generate a hash that was not known by the verifier. It's not in the set of legitimate hashes that the verifier expects. So in this way, they are able to detect uh, counterflow attacks. Then loops are challenged, uh, are uh, challenging because uh, you don't know how many times the software entered in the loop, and uh, the hash may be generated without. Um, keeping the, the track of how many times it entered. So uh, there was this uh, proposal that whenever the software goes inside the loop, the hash starts again from zero instead of starting from the previous hash. And then you keep also a counter of how many times the loop is executed. Because from different uh, inputs can be different uh, number of execution of the loop. So, uh, this is called dynamic attestation or counterflow attestation or runtime attestation, many synonyms for this type of uh, uh, attestation. And the goal was uh, is to, to detect those attacks that can manage to compromise a device without injecting a new, uh, new code. And these are realistic attacks. The, this protocol itself uh, has a high overhead of execution because it relies on software instrumentation of uh, tracing the software and so on but have been improvements on that in different aspects, for example, having a hardware way of capturing the uh, instructions and so on. Challenges of remote attestation. So we saw what is remote attestation. We saw three types of uh, attestation protocols on IoT, hybrid attestation, swarm attestation, and dynamic attestation or counterflow attestation. But there are many challenges on uh, uh, IoT uh, attestation. The first one is the privacy. Attestation in uh, TPMs has already achieved the, the privacy. And it is standardized protocol. It's called dynam uh, Direct Anonymous Attestation, DAA. And now they are even working on post-quantum version of that protocol. Because if you have uh, already heard, the TPM uh, is working on having uh, post-quantum cryptography inside uh, the chip to make it prepare for quantum attacks. We had the speech before. But privacy in IoT had not been considered before. As to the best of my knowledge, the first paper that considers that is uh, this one that we published uh, earlier this year. And the goal is to uh, allow the verifier to check if the device is trusted or not without revealing any uh, information about the device, especially uh, control flow attestation that I mentioned. If we trace the device and you, we send uh, the value or the information to the verifier to prove that the device is trusted, it can be cases that you reveal some information about the execution and verifier may not need to know that you followed the certain execution. So how can we tell to verifier that I am trusted without revealing any sensitive information? So, so this is one... Um, a uh, paper that uh, uh, tries to use the zero knowledge proof to, to, to tell to verifier that we're trusted and so on. I'm not uh, digging into the details, but if you are interested on this, you can uh, just check the paper and feel free to contact me. Then another interesting uh, approach of uh, having attestation, and I think it's quite challenging and very important nowadays, is having attestation of IoT devices that are energy harvesting. 
now we have this trend of green computing so we are going to shift uh, to green uh, devices and so on we have battery less uh, iot devices that uh, are supposed to get energy only by uh, environment or by itself by the water pressure for example or so to, to get a little of battery and uh, or a little bit of energy in order to work and then they wake up for a few seconds a few milliseconds and then they sleep again and then we want to do to, to check if this device is trusted but uh, i mean if you have uh, seen until now at the station itself is an overhead operation so basically you stop the device and you tell the device tell me now that you are trusted so if the device is, uh, is so low in energy, uh, maybe it's not uh, efficient to stop the device or tell the device, okay, now you just woke up for a few milliseconds, but don't do what you are supposed to do. Just tell me that you are trusted. And there's always this trade-off between, is it important to prove the device is trusted or is more important to do what, what it was designed to do? Or in real-time systems, for example, when, the operation can be very critical. Then you want to do a uh, remote attestation and tell, okay, um, stop what you are doing and tell me that you are trusted. So it's very important to consider solutions in attestation that are interruptible, I think. Because attestation itself by the design to guarantee security is an atomic procedure. You start and you finish because you have to prove that you are trusted. And if you are interrupted, I don't know if the part that you checked yesterday is still trusted today. So how can we design these approaches that we can interrupt attestation in order to have low impact in the, in, in the device from energy side, but also for a real time system that I, uh, that I mentioned, where the device is important to, to do its own operation. Uh, we have, uh, workshop paper which was more like an idea on how can we split the device into modules and have some uh, checkpoints in order to achieve that but it's a very early uh, stage of this uh, idea but it's an open challenge so if you can do it i'll be very happy another uh, challenge on uh, attestation when we consider the attestation of a group of devices you know that in iot devices all the communication are asynchronous so it's not that you have a challenge it's not a request reply generally in iot you have mqtt the devices are just measuring temperature sending the temperature they don't know who is getting the temperature uh, and the devices who are reading the temperature don't know from whom they got the this temperature they are just uh, processing this data. So it's very important to have this asynchronous way of communicating beyond challenge response. But the challenge is how can we assume, how can we verify that this answer or this uh, attestation result was uh, unique? Because we don't have request reply, we cannot send a challenge. How can we assume that this, or how can we verify that this answer was calculated at the real time was not a, a replay attack so there was a paper that we published three years ago the first one i think in uh, this is published in a top uh, security journal that was using the old logical clocks of lamport with the vector clocks in order to keep the history of when these events have happened and then you construct the history of course this is just the uh, initial uh, solution, how can we approach it, but it's still an open challenge to apply it in a real uh, IoT uh, devices. So to conclude, attestation, if you don't remember anything from this talk, remember that attestation is a way to detect malware. You can imagine it something like this. So it's a security protocol that will check if the device is trusted or not. It can uh, be promising in uh, establishing trust. Attestation is not to replace any of the existing protocols, so it's not to replace authentication, to replace access control, but it's a, an additional layer. It's a building block maybe for them. So maybe you first tell me that you are trusted, then I can give you access. Or tell me that you are trusted, then I can authenticate this device. Then um, we saw some uh, approaches of uh, IoT attestation, hybrid attestation, 
swarm attestation and control flow attestation to detect different types of attacks and different types of scenarios. 